This is Brian with GigDigest.com. It's our honor and privilege to be here today with a gentleman who's a pioneer in the music industry, a world-renowned performer and a successful business owner. It's our pleasure to introduce Mr. Beaver Felton. Thank you for your time today, sir. You're playing here at Castleberry's Patio Bar and Lounge tonight with your band Go 80. Can you tell us some about the band and your bandmates? Yeah, um, I'm the best and everybody else is not as good as me. That's right, ladies. I'm kidding. Now, the band, uh, actually, Franco Campanello, that used to be in a, a well-known band around here called Foreign Legion, probably 30 years ago, they had a record deal, etc. cetera. Um, this is about three, over three years ago, we kind of got together and said, let's, here's the vision. So he and I are really the co-founders of the group. And then we uh, interviewed or you know, auditioned a lot of guitar players and a lot of uh, singers and even some keyboard players. And I, I kept wanting to get Joe Stump, who's gonna be around here at some point in the future, because um, he's just really, really good. Uh, Joe's a great guitar player, great singer, great stageman, has great hair, etc. Doug, the keyboard player, is the newest uh, uh, member of the band. And by the way, Franco is the, was the drummer for Foreign Legion. He had an album out on Arrowstar or Atlantic or somebody, uh, again, many years ago. Doug, the keyboard player, I actually, by coincidence, played with him back like 40 years ago when I was getting my driver's license. Um, and he's, I say legendary because he always has been in the Southeast. He's been with Mother's Finest, John Mayo's Blues Breakers, uh, Blackfoot out of Atlanta, and he's done a lot of recording and writing and producing with other people. So I'm surrounded by great players. Wow, that's awesome. They're a great group there. What type of material you're playing with the band? You know, if I had to really break it down to a single genre, it would really kind of be classic rock with some even funk, kind of Motown stuff, even a couple of Chili Pepper songs. So a little bit of, see to me that's kind of good, Chili Peppers, showing my age here. But uh, so it's funk and rock, dance, classic rock, kind of melded together. And even like I said, because Doug's forte, the keyboard player, Doug Bear, um, he's done so much Motown and old funky feeling all right kind of stuff, Joe Cocker kind of stuff. So it kind of encompasses all that. Yeah, okay. Um, a lot of us know about your past history with Super Chops and some of your instructional um, programs. Are you still involved or active with any instructional programs or teaching in any sort of way? Well, I, because I own the store Bass Central, which is a, just a small music store just for bass, uh, I don't t teach anymore. Somebody begged me to teach the other day and I'm going, I just don't have the time. You know, I threw out a number and they said, no, they'd have to sell the car. And I said, okay, point made. I just don't have the time to do it. Because running Bay Central or owning Bay Central, um, it just kind of eclipsed my ability to continue teaching privately. As far as the tutorials, I mean, there's still videos and DVDs and cassette tapes and uh, VHS and probably beta or whatever it was back in the 20s or whatever it was. That's still on six continents. I mean, it's not uncommon for somebody to come in a store, you know, from Brazil or Australia or Asia or uh, Europe or uh, wherever, and say, yeah, I, I learned how to play bass from you, you know, a zillion years ago. And I still have your cassettes and sign us. It's now worth 25 cents. Per. So they're still out there, but I'm not really actively producing anymore. I haven't for a long time. The market's kind of blooded, if you will. There's a zillion uh, tutorials, so I'm not producing anymore. I see. Um, along those lines, though, as far as the music industry, which part of it do you like the most? Oh, playing, period. That's, that's an absolute no-brainer. Getting ready to play, you're playing, that's the most fun. More than recording, writing, etc. Awesome. Which part of the music industry on the on the converse would you find the most challenging? I'm not sure what that means. Okay, conversely. The business end. Now, that's a big umbrella, that's a, a big general statement. But yeah, just the business end. For anybody out there, you know, writing and recording and doing all that stuff, think about publishing rights, royalties, Writers, you know, mechanical, royalties, etc., etc. Because that's all big money, and that's why a lot of people get screwed over in record deals. They're so excited to get a record deal with a big label or a big producer, and they don't realize until a year or two later they only made like fifty-seven dollars. Yeah. yeah. At what point in your playing did you differentiate between you know the classical trained aspect of it and the I'm going to sit down with the record player and figure this song out note by note by ear. Where do you fall 
on those two sides of the fence, and where did you begin to differentiate a distinction between the two? The Beagles are the reason that that is there, and the reason I'm sitting here and you're doing this interview. That was the first group or musical influence that drew me to, wow, I love this music, and I want to play music, and I ultimately became bass player. That would have said age probably around 10 or 11 or 12. I think I started actually playing at about 12. Um, I got to a point, Brian, where my, my had really good technique, and I was doing what you just said, learning the licks off the records, roundabout, or something by the Beatles, or whoever, or family Parkland. But I got to a point, thank God, um, although I wish I had taken it further, where I realized I don't know really that much about this. I'm mimicking, I'm aiming something, I'm playing a lick, which is impressive, but I don't know really why does this lick fit better with this chord. So that came at about age 18. That's when I took my, my, my first three lessons, and only three lessons. But that teacher, who was an upright bass teacher, it's all applicable, no matter how you play it. Um, and that's when I got into theory, diatonic dry heads and time signatures and so on and so forth. So I probably started at age 11, and I think I get uh, 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 interested in learning about what makes up music, which I think is very important. Um, about age 17. You pointed to your bass a couple of times. That's outstanding, or can it just what you're playing tonight with the band? That is, uh, unless they fire me between now and the first set, yes. Um, yeah, this is a music man, and it's kind of ironic, I say this, uh, it's, uh, this is called the Sterling, which is named after the owner of the company. A lot of people have heard of Ernie Ball, now there's Sterling Ball. And this is a Sterling bass. And uh, he's actually the guy who bought, well, he opened, he bought Music Man from Leo Fender, because Leo Fender, after he sold Fender to CBS, started a company called Music Man, and then it was purchased by uh, uh, Ernie Ball. And the interesting thing about what I'm using now is I love this bass, and it's, uh, it's, it's great in the studio and live and all that, but ironically, of all the endorsements I've had over the last 30 years, the equipment was just thrown at me free, I actually bought this one. Now, hopefully me having just said that means that I'll receive about 10 of these in the mail in the next week or so. That certainly speaks a lot for the instrument. What sort of amplification are you playing through this evening? Um, that was a pretty good lyric, by the way. That was outstanding. Um, music, uh, rather, uh, Mesa Boogie. Again, ironically, I mean, the store carries that, and I used it, uh, and I fell in love with it. So it's ironically, you know, again, all these endorsement things I've had in the past, and now I'm using stuff that technically I'm buying. Are you much in the way of using effects, or do you just plug straight into the amp? There's a new effect I'm trying to actually uh, design. It's called How to Make You Sound Better Than You Really Are, but it's in the, the infancy stage. Uh, aside from that, I love chorus and a little bit of reverb. I think those both enrich the sound of the bass. I, I love effects, but I kind of go yeah, through those. I'll, I'll, I'll have uh, eras where I'll use a huge pedal board with a zillion effects, and other times I'll go, I'll go see a bass player in an after hours bar or something with an old bass old strings, a chord, going to an old amp, and just blow me away. That sends me back to the drawing board, so I pick up a bass, a chord, and an amp, and do whatever the effect for one. So I kind of go in and out of that, but I, I do love with that. Awesome. Going back to Bass Central for just a moment, you built a really good staff there with Mike and Nico. You've mentioned before that you work with Dave LaRue there as well, as well as Grasshopper working in the store. Did you have a rough time picking the people that are working with you? Did they come to you easily? How long did it take you to build your staff? I am not an easy guy to work for, probably. Or even work with, perhaps. Um, Base Central is highly specialized. If you call there, you're going to talk to somebody who's been playing at least 20 or 30 or 40 plus years. So, yeah, it's everybody there is a, a, a veteran musician. Uh, Mike, Grasshopper, Perry Stern, all of them are great players, and uh, and they know the equipment. So no matter how bizarre or specific of a question, the customer may want. Like, I want the sound that Jocko Pastorius got on the Weather Report album, Heavy Weather, on the second cut. How do I get those harmonics? A regular sales guy at some of those other big stores, 
they wouldn't know how to answer that question. My guys, every one of them, and myself, I think I didn't even remember the answer to that question, would be able to help and be would, would qualified to, to help a person. Here's what you're looking for based on what you just described. So I'm very proud of my staff. And to be honest, like any business, uh, the employees will make or break the business, whether it's a bar or a band or a store or a hamburger joint or whatever. In my case, I've got five, four or five really great guys out here, my good friend Danny, uh, who's uh, in charge of like marketing and he's my personal PA and he's the guy that I call Rat Bastard on Facebook, Danny Lewis, Danny Lewis. And, uh, and so yeah, I have, it took a long time to get these guys. Grasshopper's been with him 18 years. Mike, 10 years, Perry, 10 years. So it's a, a veteran staff. How can we get in touch with Face Central? Do you have a website or Facebook page? If you're a cute girl, here's my cell phone. I'll never scratch that. Um, yeah, it's it's Face Central that is spelled exactly as you think, B-A-S-S, and it'll have something like that in between. Um, you can find us very easily since it's an internet age. Google Base Central or BaseCentral.com. It's very simple. Do you have Facebook or any social media for yes. Go 80 Band? Or? Yeah, we do. Uh, uh, Danny helps with that. And I, I think Franco handles. Are you still doing the finger exercises on the steering wheel? No. Uh, that was actually on the dashboard. And believe it or not, from that video that was shown on Jimmy Fallon, uh, that exercise, even though it, is, it does look funny and funky and whatever and goofy, but I actually got that from a violinist who played many years ago with the New York Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra. And not only did she do the first knuckle, but also the second knuckle, and even the uh, third knuckle. In other words, these are legit for string players. So as goofy as it may sound, I'm kind of a, a, a fanatic about time management. So if I'm driving and I can do finger ex exercises, that's where that whole you know, uh, practicing in the car came from. Well, tell us about how the Jimmy Fallon reference came exactly. about with it. Yeah. The video was brought on as a spoof on old videos you don't want to watch. So you'd think it was goofy and kind of, you know, I don't know what you'd call it, something you'd be uh, embarrassed by. The fact of the matter is that video was the second best-selling bass video, instructional video, in 1993. And the video, and I stand by this to this day, it was like real laid from uh, Letterman, I mean, there's a huge amount of endorsers that use that video. So, so uh, ultimately, even though it was brought, off, brought on as a spoof, old videos, there's my, the little bit of playing you could hear uh, was good. And I've now gotten in touch with uh, some of the guys on Fallon's show. By the way, Jimmy, give me a call when you get a chance. Put this um, man on, Jimmy. Yeah, I'm waiting. Cute girls or Jimmy Fallon? Allow it. Anyway. Um, in any event, uh, 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 one of the members of the staff said, yeah, after the show, some of the guys in the band, or he recognized you know, who you were or whatever, not just some goofy guy making a, a video in the basement, but a well-known player and a well-known instructor with a well-known video that's on six continents. I mean, it's everywhere except Antarctica. So, it was brought on as a spoof, but, you know, I couldn't have bought that much space time. And somebody even said, you know, they said your name like 17 times, you know, on the, you know, the, the, uh, the Beaver Cult close-ups of me, the video, playing and all that. And so I, I got a million dollars worth of advertisement, I think. They kept me on for a while. And then when Howie Mandel came back, came on later, he did, I can't remember what they call it in comedy, where a throwback or a kickback or a give back or something. And uh, they were talking about his daughter getting married, and he made a comment about, yeah, she just married Beaver Feldman bringing that name back up. So it was great. I mean, I had my face and my name up there. Um, so a lot more people now know who I am. You know, probably about 90 before I really get that uh, huge. But uh, over and above musicians who've known me, I think, for a long time. Now there's a lot of normal people slash non-musicians that uh, know my name. So it was it was great. Awesome. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm hoping that Jimmy would bring me on. It's a great segue, really. You know, we had this guy at video, now we're going to watch him play. He'll play with the Roots. Or, I think it would also, because I've heard, you know, I was in a bad car accident when I was on the road back in 85. Right after I first got internationally recognized uh, in the Car Player Magazine, just by sheer irony. Um, and over these, you know, 20, 30 years, I've heard from, you know, thousands of people 
you're really inspirational, you know, for people that, you know, would have an injury or condition or disability. So I think there's even a human interest angle there too. So um, I think you get on the balance show. Absolutely, I'd love to be outstanding to see you there. Great band, you would mix so well with them. They are superb. Speaking of your accident, could you tell us a little bit about after your accident, how long did it take you to get back into playing? Because I know that that was kind of when the video career started taking off for you. A Precisely. Bit it changed my entire life and career trajectory. I was in a band called Camara out of Orlando. The guys were still great friends of mine. And uh, after the accident, they ultimately replaced me, of course. And uh, that's when I started doing the instructional thing. I'd already been teaching for years. So it was kind of a, okay, I can't go on a road, the world isn't really wheelchair friendly. And in the 80s, you know, you just don't really, you know, you're talking about mid-80s MTV, it's just not really the right thing for a rock band, to be very blunt and honest back then. I think disabilities are much more accepted nowadays, and that's good. But, you know, we're talking rewind almost 30 years. So um, that's when I got into the Super Chop thing and started with cassette tapes, and that went over great, so I made more. Then uh, Hot Licks uh, contracted me to do a video. And I produce more of my own uh, videos. And then uh, Doug Marks, thanks, Doug. Uh, everybody remembers him from every guitar magazine Absolutely. in the world. Metal Method. Still there. He contracted me to do a, a, a heavy metal power bass three-take three, three course, which uh, I don't think it's still in, in uh, production or anything, but that was good. And then Hal Leonard, who's a big publishing company, like Mel Bay. And so everything really blossomed. So to be very honest, um, as they say in a lot of videos, and I hope this is OK on the video, People will say, well, what do you think would have happened minus the accident? I could have gone on to become a, a, a real rock star. I could have become an accountant or a drug addict. I don't know. I mean, each of these things that happens in your life, I call it the domino effect you know, philosophy of everything big uh, is going to affect uh, uh, the next thing. And yeah. it's affected by the previous thing. We can so never tell honest, where each turn is going to yeah, take us. I, I did get, um, after, right after my accident, which is right when I was featured guitar player, um, Mike Barney and yet another guy asked me to come out or mention something about you'd be good in some of my bands or whatever. But they didn't know about the accident, and you know, for a good year I was just trying to figure out which way is up. Kind of left you in limbo? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But that's the way, that, that's what gave birth to the whole instructional stuff. Again, and that became Bay Central. That's the way I finance Bay Central, and that's where we are right here. Outstanding. Well, we certainly thank you for your time here today. You're a great inspiration and an incredible, <laughs> an incredibly phenomenal player. Yes, Once again, we want to thank you very much for your time here today with Gig Digest at Castleberry, at Castleberry's Patio Bar and Lounge. Hey. Thank you again, Mr. Felton. I am honored to have been interviewed. Thanks a million. And all that stuff I said, I'm joking. I'm not really that good at all. What are we talking about? We're running. Uh -huh. All right, we're back with Beaver Felton and it's a couple of members of the Go 80 band. We're here with Joe Stump and Doug Bars. How are you guys doing tonight? Very well. How are you? Good. Uh, you all are playing later here tonight at Castleberries? Absolutely. Ready to rock the house, baby. Awesome. What kind of material? We do a mishmash. We do 60s, we do 70s, we do 80s, some 90s. All rock. Rock and roll, you know. Tell us a little bit about your backgrounds. I was born. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Uh, I've been playing since I was about 15 years old. Been in lots and lots of bands. Toured the southeast United States with uh, several top 40 acts. Lived in Orlando all my life. Still do. Uh, played out of Disney, all the all the theme parks, Universal. Uh, played just about every bar in this town. Love it. Loving every minute of it. Joe, and, uh, Joe won't say this, sir, to interrupt. I worked hard to get this guy in this band. We auditioned like a thousand guitar players. And finally he came available, or I, uh, somebody bribed him or something. He that's kidnapped up, me. That's how we ended up with uh, Joe Stump. He kidnapped me one day, <laughs> held, me, uh, held me for ransom, and nobody paid the ransom, so here I am. That's what it was. Going 80. Right on. How about you, Doug? Well, I'm a New Orleans boy. And I grew up uh, playing pretty much on Bourbon Street. And then in 1970, uh, 
my parents moved to uh, Savannah, Georgia, and I wound up moving up there with them. And that's when I met this dude. So we played back in 71, 72 together. The Savannah Connection. In Savannah. And then we went back to New Orleans, and uh, in 76, I, pr I, I moved to Atlanta. And that's when, uh, you know, I kind of stepped into some stuff there. I had a band called Whiteface that signed with uh, Polygram. Mercury and we did one album, two albums that went nowhere. But uh, it got me into some other bands. It got me later on. I was with a band called Mother's Finest. Excellent. You might have heard of them. And and, uh, and then Blackfoot, believe it or not. You may have heard of them. But Blackfoot, when I joined Blackfoot, it was actually three of us from Mother's Finest with Ricky Medlock. That was the new book, supposed to be the new Blackfoot. Ricky. And uh, so we had a great band, but it just they were expecting, uh, you know, train, train. And, we weren't bad at all, you know. So, well, we did one record for Atlantic, and, uh, and then I did two uh, albums with them, uh, with an independent label. And then I moved back to Atlanta in '91 and hung out there for a couple of years, and then came down here to work at Universal Studios in '93. And I was there almost 12 years. You know, I think I was playing uh, uh, a club down down Atlanta. Yeah, you, you walked you, in, the, you, you know, were playing Sloppy Joe's. That's right. That's right. And I was in Savannah when I first met Bieber, probably. I knew him. I'd seen him play on stage uh, many years before in Hoochie and whatnot. And uh, when he lived and moved back to Savannah after his accident, that's pretty much where he and I got to become better friends. And because uh, I spent a lot of time in Savannah playing. And uh, I saw Doug for the first time in Universal being the piano man. It wasn't that Finnegan's or Finneman's? Yeah, I played at Finnegan's, Finnegan's. And, I up, and then I went over to Pat O'Brien's. Pat O'Brien's, yep. And uh, so the Savannah connection is there, the Orlando connection is there. Well, I was in Janie Lane Sunset Strip, which was one of the biggest rock bars in Orlando back in the day. JJ Whispers, you may remember that name. Fade to Black. Back in the 90s. And here we are, all come together to make beautiful noises. Did you fire Franco or did he uh, get an accident on I'm the I'm not way sure if, uh, let's, not, let's, not, let's not wish another accident on Franco. Please. I talked right. to him earlier. <laughs> Well, we posed this question to Beaver earlier, um, Joe and Doug. I'd just like to get your response on it. Do you guys think that the community around here does enough to support the arts and local music in general? Wow. And what can be done about that? It's difficult. I think people I such as yourself are doing a great job. And uh, any kind of magazine and any kind of website and any kind of stuff that promotes local bands and local bars is a great thing. And bands really, it, it behooves them all to promote themselves. It's a self-promotion world now. It's Facebook and it's electric media, electronic media and uh, Twitter. I, tw I don't even do, I don't even have a cell phone that flips open yet. So, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty much the self-promotion situation for everybody. And uh, the bars, they could pay a little more money. Yeah, uh, yeah you made the same state, but it's kind of Be a little bit more discerning about the talent they hire, maybe. Uh, but then again, you get what you pay for, and it's a, you know, it's a it's a uh, supply demand dynamic as as with everything else in life. There's a lot more bands than there are clubs, so there's a lot of competition. It's a big city, even though it's just a little old Orlando. It's a pretty big city. Yeah, and it's you know when bigger. when you think about Joe being in a, being the, the, the best groups in the southeast, I, I'm not sure what I've done, but in any event. And this guy who's played in at least three national acts, and here we are playing a relatively not so huge club. And that kind of speaks to, kind of like Joe was saying, it's kind of demand and supply. But we love to play, so we're playing. Well, speaking with other markets in, in that similar vein, let's say you go to Austin, Texas, for example. Some of the bars there aren't quite as big either, but yet you will get legendary acts in there. Sure. What would need to happen around this area for that same type of environment to be fostered and to be able to flourish? I don't think I have an answer for well, that. You, Doug? This is a tourist city. Yeah. And they're going to, they're, this, uh, when you say Orlando, Disney World, man, that's it. They, they, they don't take it serious as a, as a music city. Uh, we should uh, hire I Mickey Mouse? I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. Uh, what's Orlando known musically for? The Backstreet Boys. In sync. In sync. Uh, it's all uh, boy bands. And now, I mean, between that and karaoke, which has destroyed rock and roll, thank you very much. <laughs> destroyed it. We're a bunch of old codgers. We're sorry. We are. We are. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. Karaoke has way. destroyed rock and roll. DJ's Japanese karaoke. got us back. 
And uh, I think the Plaza Live does a great job of putting on really uh, not some huge national. I mean, Queen's Reich just played there. The place holds 2,000 people. You know, so that's that's a great venue for national acts. Yeah, we um, saw Malmsteen there last Malmsteen, year. Malmsteen, exactly. Eric Johnson. I've seen a I bunch of really Kev good Kev acts there. there Johnny Winters played there. You got the House of Blues. You know, it's the the 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 seat theaters like the Bob Carr, the Plaza Live, the, the new um, the new performing arts venue. Hopefully, we'll have some of that. Well, realistically, wasn't it just like that in the 70s and 80s? Though that's where most of the music that is still around today that's where it came from it didn't come from stadium bands because really there were no stadium bands right. at, that, at that point right yeah. the great southern music hall was an old downtown fixture yeah for years and years and years and it's gone it's a dance club now i believe now well, the times have changed man i mean it's the 70s you didn't have video you didn't have yeah, MTV. instant facebook you didn't, you have, didn't have a computer you know you, you know, you it was just access to 10, hey, So what did you do? You went out and saw a rock and roll band. Yeah. I mean, when I lived in Atlanta, you could go out to 10 major clubs and see 10 national acts every yeah. night. Every night there was something. Well, hey, that's exactly what we're doing tonight. I know that you guys got to get ready for the rest of the evening tonight, and I don't want to take up any more of your time. Appreciate I appreciate your time. what you've given to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Gig Digest applauds you. Gig Digest, baby, right on.